Hey, I'm just waiting for people to, to come on in. So you can hear my voice, go ahead and comment. Howdy, David Foltz. Appreciate you. Man, David and Andy in, this, in the group moderating. Andy's a moderator and an administrator. He's going for it. Hola. I'm going to wait for a few more people to trickle in while I set up the screen and all this stuff. I'll go ahead and get that set up. I just jumped in from another um, educational call. So this is a lot of fun diving in, double down on education. Let's see here. Oh my gosh, Jackie. So Jackie was just in the call I was on just a minute ago. So she's she gets extra credit. All right, let's go with it. So um, this is not Andy Panko. This is Cody Garrett. Let me uh, put on my put on my boots here. There we go. Cody Garrett, CFP. I'm a certified financial planner, owner of Measure Twice Financial, a financial planning firm that serves DIY investors on the path to early retirement. Uh, but more importantly, I am a financial educator, uh, the mo one of the moderators of this group, and just passionate about sharing education with you as often as I can. So uh, that is who I am. And I'm going to start off. Awesome. Comments are in. Uh, I'm going to start off with some jokes because that's what we do here. Um, so my first joke is my wife wants to buy a horse, but first we need it. I'll start over. Sorry about that. My wife wants to buy a horse, but first we need a stable income. Is that a good one? The second is, I was going to make a joke about my paycheck, but it turns out I have insufficient puns. <laughs> All right, that's it for me and humor. Let's dive in. Okay, so this week, um, the topic area, I don't have the thing in the background like Andy does. I think he's gonna have to build me one. But the topic this week is how to review a pay statement. So R, R, R says, Teresa. So last week, we not last week, last month has been a while. We talked about how to review a mortgage statement. So we dug deeper into those, really the quantitative and the qualitative uh, details you can find within a mortgage statement. And if you go to measuretwicemoney.com, that article is now posted, including that template we talked about. So if you want to go look at last month's, uh, that video is on YouTube, I believe. And also, uh, you can go into uh, that article at measuretwicemoney.com. So today is so much fun. We're going to dig deeper into financial documents. This time, we're going to look at a pay statement. So I'm not just going to talk about a pay statement, but we're going to look at a real pay statement, a real live pay statement. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, see, I'll, I'll make this a little bigger bigger and better. Everything's bigger in Texas. Uh, let's see here. Can everybody see this on their screen? Any comments going on? Let them come through. Can you see the stuff? Awesome, Facebook user. Awesome. So this is the Measure Twice Money branded. Um, thank you, Teresa, as well. This, so this is the Measure Twice Money pay statement that I've created to really show you, you know, go deeper in understanding, you know, what types of things should we be looking for? Really, we're going to look at everything on the statement. But um, really, there's three things that we're really going to dig deeper into, which is earnings, deductions, and taxes. So David Fultz, thankfully has just uh, put a link to this document. If you want to put the PDF on your, if you have like one of those like minority report, like four, four monitors, you can go ahead and put it on a different monitor, monitor and follow along. Otherwise, you can simply look at the share screen here. Um, and I'll also zoom into each area of the, uh, of the document. Um, so when is the last time you reviewed a pay statement, right? I think uh, the last time I viewed, a, well, you know, I guess we used to call them pay stubs, right? Is probably probably five years ago. 
know, I used to get the envelope twice a week and it would have my paycheck, which of course was the part I was excited about. And then this like little, you know, folded up green piece of paper that I just kind of threw away, which was actually the, like the supporting pay stub, you know, the, the, the pay statement. So this is one of those documents that especially now as financial documents have become digitized and we don't, you know, we don't get them at our, they don't show up on our desk or in our little uh, slot at work or even mailed to us, we have to log in and kind of go through this exercise to see it digitally. So most families don't look at this stuff, but I really encourage you, you know, and everybody in the group to start looking at their financial documents in more detail. And I'm going to talk about really the qu the quantitative, you know, like the, really the, the black and white numbers on the page, that uh, the, qu the quantitative information, but also talk about some qualitative, really conversations you can have with your family moving forward that are based on the information on this pay statement. Uh, so to, to start, um, to create this pay statement, I actually reviewed 40 real pay statements across different industries to kind of do like a, you know, kind of a best of like find, find some details that were on certain ones that I want to share that might be on your own. So if you have your own pay, pay statement in front of you, even better, you can kind of look at your own, uh, as we go along, this will also be recorded, I'm sure, uh, and put on YouTube soon. So I'm going to jump right in. So on the pay statement, you'll see on the top. Let's see if I can. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and move some screens around real fast so I can get everything in front of me. All right. So when we look at the pay statement, first, we're going to start with really the basics, which are employee and employer information. So when you're looking at your pay stub, your pay statement, the first thing, of course, you want to look at is, is this me, right? I'm not Susan Staple, uh, Susan Sampleton. Uh, but uh, I, I decided to hire her apparently at Measure Twice Money. So name, company, and then you may not have known, but you probably have an employee ID. So Susan's employee ID is 529-401-403. And you all get extra credit if you know what all those numbers mean in the finance world, right? Um, and the, the next thing I look at on a pay statement, you know, now that we're, we're, we're past the basics, is your pay period begin and pay period end. So this is your pay frequency, really how often how often you're paid, right? So you can see here that the pay period began April 3rd, pay period ended April 16th, which is two weeks. So you can tell that they get paid every two weeks and they get paid, their check date when they actually get paid is a week after the pay period end. So all these numbers are calculated on the 16th and then they're actually paid on the 23rd, which is the Friday after. Um, so they're, they're paid every two weeks. So once we know the pay frequency, it makes it a lot easier moving forward to really, you know, we can annualize or figure out like, you know, what these numbers might look like at the end of the year, especially when we're doing tax planning or really understanding things like how much am I really paying for health insurance through my employer? So we're going to go deeper, but we really need to know that pay frequency to get started. So moving down from here again, yeah, they get, they get paid. They get paid every other Friday, um, and uh, Su Susan gets um, so eight periods have passed since the beginning of the year. Which since she gets paid twenty six times per year bi weekly, um, there's eighteen periods remaining. So we're going to keep that in our mind that there are eighteen more paychecks that Susan's going to get uh, in this year. Which again, we're using a twenty twenty one statement, so this is going to be important moving forward. So this is last year's statement. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll down here to the bottom, and you can see. You might also have your pay statement. They call it absent plans here. Um, but really, this is where you can look at your vacation and sick pay. You can see you're accrued, right? That's just like, you know, how much you've earned. You, you know, sometimes your employer, like for every week you, you, every week you work, you might get a certain amount of hours accrued. Um, so this is reduced. So this is how many vacation or sick days or hours that, that um, Susan has taken year to date. So she hasn't taken any and it's April now. Um, and she has 10 days, so she has 80 hours of vacation time and 24 hours of sick pay uh, available to her, you know, through the end of the year. And this is one of those really important things to understand. Certainly, you can just divide that by eight. Um, so you can yeah, divide by eight because, uh, as we'll see later on, she works eight hours a day. Um, but this vacation pay and sick pay, depending on your employer, may or may not carry over to future years. So let's say you're looking at your pay statement at the beginning of December and you have, you know, four days of vacation left and through looking at your employee benefits, that vacation pay is not going to, uh, you know, not going to go over to the next year. Guess what? You're probably going to want to take up, you know, 
take a few days after before Christmas or, you know, take an extra New Year's break. Um, go ahead and start talking with your family about your vacation and sick pay. Of course, hopefully nobody, you know, thinks about being sick or, you know, uh, schedules that, you know, months in advance, but just start having these conversations with your family. Now, let's say you have a spouse who also has her own or his own uh, vacation pay and sick pay, you know, figure out, Hey, like I've got three days left. I've got 10 days left. Like, how are we going to do this? Maybe, maybe we'll take the three days off together. And then the remaining seven, maybe I can do some extra, you know, work around the house that we've been talking about, or I can go see my sister in another state. Right. So ha start having qualitative family, uh, family discussions, even about these, you know, this data on a, on a pay statement. So now that we've looked at pay time off, I also do, I also do, uh, I made a note here that again, like, don't just, don't just fill up, don't just, you know, save up your vacation time. Like to, even if it does roll over to future years, like this, this should also make you pretty mindful about, Hey, you know, I understand that physical, mental, spiritual, relational, and financial wellness are, are all related right? So if you haven't taken vacation in the last five years, that might be saying something about, you know, maybe some forms of wellness might need improving that could, you know, be improved, especially relational and uh, mental wellness by taking some vacation. So don't just think of vacation as money, right? Yes, like this represents money, right? But at the same time, vacation represents, this can kind of give you a hint of, hey, maybe I should take a break, right? Uh, before the end of the year. So let's go into the fun stuff that everybody likes outside of vacation time, which is earnings, right? This is the part that really, this is a, this is all of the, this is all the money you're getting paid for all the value and the time and the expertise you're putting into your job uh, as an employee. So you can see earnings here. Uh, this is broken down in the, into the types of wages or tips or other sorts of earnings. So you can see that Susan, um, not this paycheck, but previously she actually got a sweet bonus she got paid eighty-seven thousand dollars for you know in, uh, called an incentive bonus, but you can see here she got a recognition award for sixty-five hundred earlier in the year. Um, but the thing that you're going to see pretty much on every paycheck is regular salary or regular wages. So you can see that Susan, so she gets paid her regular salary. She works eighty hours every two weeks, so forty hours a week. She gets paid a pretty nice pretty nice number here. She gets paid $111.53.1 per hour, uh, which really, um, you know, comes to this number of 89.2250. And again, it's this rate probably doesn't, they probably didn't start with the rate. They really said, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm multiplying 80, uh, 89.2250 times how much she, you know, how often she gets paid. So she gets, she makes about 232,000, 232,000 in base salary plus any, any bonuses. So um, just quickly, I'll run down the, the other sources, really variable sources outside of regular, um, outside of these types of earnings are, I'll run down the list that you might see on your pay statement are performance bonus, retention bonus, stock compensation, commissions, overtime, training, orientation, paid time off. So when you do pay, take your vacation, it will end up showing up uh, probably on earnings. Uh, your severance pay, um, retroactive pay. Let's say that you weren't paid for something you did last year, right? Or you know, just getting paid after the fact. Um, tax taxable fringe benefits. We'll talk about in a minute. Uh, expense reimbursements, transportation mileage, a cell phone, or a fitness center that's you know not uh, a fitness center that's not within your your business structure. Like they might give you a you know a taxable benefit for for working out because they want you to come to work pumped up. How do I get Susan's job? I like the pay. Well, you can apply to work at Measure Twice Money. Now she, <laughs> uh, but maybe, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, keep in touch with Susan. Maybe she'll sell her uh, position to you someday. Uh, so now that we know all the earnings, we can assume for a minute that all of these are taxable as ordinary income. But to find out if that's true, we're going to start at earnings is really the gross, gross earnings is the starting point. So now we're going to back out deductions, right? Before we get to taxes, we're going to get to deductions. So first we're going to talk about pre-tax deductions. When you see pre-tax deductions here, that means deductions that are, that uh, are excluded. So all these deductions are excluded from taxable income 
So this means excluded from, I think you can see this here. So this is a form W-2, right? So as an employee, you'll receive a W-2 and your taxable income comes to box one right here. So on the pay statement, you'll see that there's a lot of pre-tax benefits that aren't even included on the W-2 in box one. So when a lot of people, they, they say, hey, we're like, I contributed to a you know, pre-tax 401k or I contributed to an HSA, like that number is going to be excluded here. It's going to show up otherwise on the, on the W-2, but not in box one as part of the income. It's already been excluded from income. It's not going to be deducted from income when you do your taxes. So our pre-tax deductions that we're going to look at are the pre-tax 401k. So um, certainly retirement plans are, are most likely going to be either pre-tax or post-tax deductions. So my notes here, right? So you may contribute to mandatory or elective, which means voluntary, uh, defined contribution retirement plans, such as pre-tax 401a, like pension plans, 401k, 403b, 457s, right? So these contributions are excluded from taxable income meaning they reduce taxable income at your highest marginal tax rate. So these are, this, these are my Skittle colors that I have for you. Um, taste the rainbow. These are the marginal tax rates on the left side, right? So when you contribute to a pre-tax retirement account, you are technically excluding that from your income at the marginal, at the highest, kind of the last dollar, the marginal rate in a way. Again, you can, you know, money money's fungible. So it's not necessarily that you're, you know, we're going to take out your your 401k contribution, and then your HSA in terms of, you know, which one saves, uh, you know, which one's excluded first. But you can just see that, um, let's say that I am in married filing jointly, I make $150,000. Um, and this is taxable income, which has been reduced already by the standard or itemized deductions. So if I'm in the 22% bracket, and I contribute to my uh, for my traditional 401k, I'm going to be excluding that income at the 22% bracket. So Susan has contributed to her 401k pre-tax. So she's not, she's going to exclude this income in the year of contribution. But when she takes that money out in retirement, it'll be included in her taxable income income at whatever tax rate she's at at that point, right? Whether 0%, you know, below the standard or itemized deductions all the way up to, you know, again, these marginal brackets go all the way to 37 currently. So if I look at this amount, again, we're coming back to how do I review a, um, how do I review a, a pay statement? Um, I can see that this amount for this paycheck, wow, she contributed $2,000 to her 401k, right? Just this pay period, which is if I divide $2,000 into her earnings, you can tell that she has elected to contribute 23% of her gross earnings to her 401k. So you say, hey, well, Susan is under 50. So last year in 2021, she could only contribute $19,500 to her 401k, right? Or, you know, at least her, pre, her pre-tax her elective 401k. So you can see that really within the next two pace periods, she's going to fully max out her 401k. So if you are doing something like this, when you're maxing out your retirement plans early on in the year, or before the end of the year, you need to ensure that your employer, your you know your payroll department has what's called is truing up the matching contribution. If your if your employer, for example, matches three percent, you know up to you know whatever uh, you know a certain amount of your income or up to three percent of your income, make sure that if you're contributing early on, if you're maxing out, you're like kind of front loading your four hundred one k contributions. Make sure you're still getting the match like on those, on those later pay, payroll periods. If you're not, it could make sense to spread this out throughout the year if you're not receiving what's called a true up. Again, you can talk with your plan administrator or your, um, your HR department to ask if you receive that. Let's see here. Um, so one thing about the employee contributions to retirement plans is that they're excluded from taxable income, uh, you know, for federal income and state income tax, but they are, but they are subject to employment taxes, which we'll talk about in a minute with Medicare and Social Security. So moving down here, you'll see, you know, the, the other pre-tax deductions are, you'll see medical, vision, dental. So, you know, mo most, uh, most employees will see this on their pay statement as long as they're contributing something to their, to their healthcare benefits. 
you can see here that she's contributing 250 oops 250 dollars a paycheck to pre-tax medical right and you can also see that she's contributing to an hsa right which immediately tells me that she has access to a high deductible health plan and this hsa since i can see how much she's contributing oops if i multiply this by 26 i can see that she's on track to contribute the maximum 7,200 family contribution to her HSA last year. Yeah, so David asks, would Susan run into the highly compensated employee program problem given her I income with her 401k? So yes, so there are rules within 401ks where if you're a highly compensated employee, again, there's there's like there's there's testing and rules behind this, is if you know Susan makes too much money, she'll be exposed to, you know, to plan testing. To make sure that she's not being, you know, she doesn't have more opportunities than, than like the average, you know, the kind of, you know, the, the non-highly compensated employees. So one way they can get around the, the non the highly compensated employee rules that would limit her contributions is if they do like, for example, a safe harbor, a safe harbor match. Um, David Meyer says depends on how much who else contributes. Yes. So it's based on how, you know, how much the, you know, how much the other employees contribute to the plan. Um, as well in terms of elective deferral. Um, but for example, let, let's just use here that she has, um, her, you know, her employer, which is, I guess, measure twice money at this point, um, that she retreat, she receives a, what's called a safe harbor match. So by receiving a 4% match on her contributions, you know, hundred percent of the first 3% and 50% of the next 2%, you know, which effectively is a 4% um, employer match. Um, that safe harbor means that She's, you know, that actually like kind of, you know, that bypasses that those rules to be, uh, you know, to not be able to contribute as much as a highly compensated employee. Uh, Jackie asked if her employer made contributions to her HSA, would it show up on her pay stub? That's a really great, um, a really great thing there. So that usually shows up if your employer contribution, well, actually I'll back up. So when you're contributing to an HSA, so you can see that that Susan is contributing as an employee, the max contribution of 7,200, right? The, the employee and the employer contributions together are subject to the, to, to the uh, contribution limits. So I can see here, Jackie, you bring up a great conversation that you can have that is, hey, I see that you're maxing out your HSA as the employee alone. So we need to make sure that your employer is not contributing at all to your HSA. Otherwise, you'll end up over contributing. The employer contribution to the HSA will usually show up here under employer paid benefits, but not always, right? So this is something you definitely want to look at the employee handbook to see if they're contributing as the employer as well. So um, one thing I say here is these are all of the pre-tax deductions. Uh, so these are all of the medical the medical contributions from the employee side, but you'll also see these are usually shared, right? So the healthcare is also shared by the employer. So they they pay a portion of the medical, they pay a portion of the dental, and and you can see that they don't pay any of the vision. So vision is like completely voluntary. Um, that's that's something that Susan chose on her own, but still is a pre-tax deduction. When you see um, there's something called a Go to my notes here, just so I say everything correct. Okay, so your employer most likely offers something called a Section 125 cafeteria plan, right? I, uh, I'll share a link after this, uh, after this on the on the video with links to more information about this. But a cafeteria plan is kind of like when you're going through a cafeteria, a food cafeteria. You're going through the line, and you get to choose like which entree do you want, like which dessert do you want. Like I always chose, you know, I always chose the Jello or the you know, or the, or the chocolate, uh, the chocolate pudding, right? So your employer, when you, when you sign up, when you have open enrollment as an employee, you get to decide kind of which ones do I want? Like I want the, I want the high deductible health plan rather than the low deductible plan, because I want to be able to contribute to an HSA rather than FSA, or I want to, you know, I want, you know, I don't want vision because I think that's a waste of money, but I do want dental because my teeth are messed up and I'm probably going to use that. Um, right. So you can, you can pick and choose which which employee benefits you receive and right and these are in the pre-tax the pre-tax area here those are called um that's called a section 125 cafeteria plan is how they can offer all those benefits to you without them showing up uh without them showing up as taxable income to you all these contributions 
Let's see here. Oh, so one thing about employer, um, a lot of a lot of people ask, well, how much am I actually paying, or how much would it cost to cover healthcare after I retire? Right. So we're taxes and retirement. So this may be uh, timely. Is that when when you leave your employer, it depends like on their plan, but most likely you'll be offered up to 18 months of COBRA, which is continued health coverage through your gr uh, group healthcare plan, right? So you'll have to figure out how, how much would that cost if I left, right? First of all, you could ask your employer, certainly like, hey, well, when I leave, how much would it cost per month? But on the, really the rule of thumb or on average, you're going to pay 102% of the employer plus employee contributions to your health plan. So what I've done here is I've looked at how much you are contributing in terms of your medical, and then how much the employer was contributing, and combined, combined, they actually end up, it actually ends up being about $20,000 a year that you're contributing just to medical. That's not even including the dental and vision, just your regular health plan. You're together contributing, you know, you're, you're paying $20,000 a year for that. And um, another way you can find this, let's say, you know, it's at the beginning of the year, so you can't really see this yet. You can go to your W-2 that you probably just received in the mail. You can go to box 12. It'll show up in one of, you know, one of these box 12s. So there's codes that you're going to see on your W-2. Uh, there's a whole list of codes. Um, I'm going to share that link as well and all the, the list of all the different codes you can see in box 12. But where is it? It's in my notes here. All right, here we go. So in box 12, your your combined employer contributions and employee contributions are going to be in box 12 with code DD. So DD will be the code, and then it'll say the combined employee and employer contributions together. And if you multiply that by 1.02 or 102%, you can kind of ballpark how much it would cost to continue your health coverage, you know, moving forward with COBRA versus going on uh, ACA or another uh, like a health sharing or other other healthcare route in retirement. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to, let's see. One thing you'll see here is that Susan's contributing to an HSA. So she has access to a high deductible health plan through work. Um, she, you know, A lot of people, you might see if you have a lower deductible plan, you'll see that you're contributing to an FSA. So an HSA is a health savings account. Right. So note that word savings, whereas a flexible spending account has the word spending in it. So a flex, flexible spending account is spent in that year, whereas a, a health savings account, you can save in, in, you know, to future years. That, that money can roll over to future years. And even a lot of HSA plans allow you to even invest that money for long term growth if you'd like to consider using it for something like um, for healthcare, healthcare expenses in retirement, or just as another uh, pre-tax retirement account that could potentially be tax-free if used for medical. Let's see. David Myers says, when that first required to be reported, it was Miss. David, besides. Okay, so so yes, yeah, so Susan here, David, uh, David Fultz. So you know, Susan here does have a, a Roth 401k option, but she chose to go pre-tax uh, based on a lot of variables, including that, um, you know, she she said, well, this is, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be in this bracket, you know, like, I don't expect myself to be in this high bracket moving forward. So I'd rather, I'd rather exclude this income from my, um, I'd rather ex exclude this income at the, um, you know, let's say that they, as a combined, uh, you know, they were, they were combined in the 32% marginal tax bracket. He said, hey, I want to exclude this at 32% because in retirement, I specifically, Susan said to me that she, you know, she thinks she's going to be effectively in the 10% bracket in retirement, right? So she chose pre-tax, but Roth was an option for Susan. Uh, we'll, we'll pretend in this circumstance. Um, so HSA, FSA, um, one thing, uh, I guess we'll get, we'll get into employment taxes, but the HS, a lot of these, um, these cafeteria plan uh, deductions are also excluded from employment taxes, which we'll talk about uh, just next. So moving into post-tax deductions over here, um, you can see that she has um, she's contributing to long-term disability, right? So if you're contributing after tax for your disability benefits, 
for your disability insurance through work or even on a private plan, if you, so you're not receiving a tax benefit for those contributions. That means your disability in benefits, if you needed that income, uh, if you actually, you know, arrived at a place of disability and needed that income, you'd receive it tax free because you paid the premiums with after tax money, right? If you pay, if your employer pays for your disability insurance, right? Or if you, or if you pay as a pre-tax, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's any type of pre-tax deduction, you're going to actually have to pay taxes on those benefits. One thing that you'll see here that Susan's employer does is that she, her employer, oh, here we go. Her employer pays for disability insurance. But get this, they make it taxable. It's called imputed income. So this is money that she's not receiving as net pay, but you know, on her pay statement, um, she's re she's actually decided, or him, her employer's decided that she's going to pay for this long-term disability. Her employer pays for it, but she's going to pay the taxes as if she received that as income, for, so that whenever she gets the disability benefits, they're going to be received tax-free. So that her only post-tax deduction would be long-term disability. But this is also where you'd see things like the Roth 401k contribution um, or after-tax 401k contributions. So the rest of the employer paid benefits, you can see they did, you know, the medical, the dental. Um, so the same thing occurs within what we call it imputed income. Uh, group term life. So you can see here that an employer can contribute to, um, they, can, they can pay for a group term life policy for employees up to a death benefit of $50,000. Right, not very much, but maybe enough to kind of get through some transition upon death for the family. But they can pay for up to fifty thousand dollar death benefit without that benefit being taxable, right, to the employ to the employee. So, if the employer, so most employers will will cover usually a, a multiple of your income. Let's say they say uh, we're going to cover you know two times two times your salary up to this amount. That's pretty typical, right? So if they're going to, if they're going to, if, if your employer is going to pay for a death benefit over $50,000, you're also going to see that as imputed income right here. So you can see this. So this is actually income to the employee, even though they're not receiving that money, they're not making that payment to the group life, uh, the group term uh, life insurance policy themselves. So other things you might see here are, um, in terms of in, in terms of uh, life insurance, you'll see also uh, accidental death, dismemberment, AD and D insurance. Uh, we talked about disability insurance, short term and long term. One thing to keep in mind is that you might you might know that a, like a homeowner's insurance or a auto deductible, uh, sorry, an auto insurance, they're going to have like money. You're going to have to pay you know you're going to have to pay a deductible as dollars and cents. Whereas long term disability, for example. This, this has something called an elimination period, which is the amount of days you have to wait before they provide any income benefits to you. So you have to be disabled for a certain amount of time called the elimination period before benefits kick in. So even though disability, you don't have to pay a dollar deducti deductible. It has kind of like a, a time equivalent deductible called the elimination period with your disability insurance. So look at your employee benefits to see how long would I need to be disabled before my disability kicks in, right? Short term usually kicks in really, you know, pretty quickly within a week or so. And then long-term disability usually starts when the short-term disability ends. And also when you look at your disability insurance, keep in mind that there's different, there's different definitions of disability. Sometimes it's own occupation, meaning if you can't continue doing your your own, you know, really your own occupation in terms of like your your skill set, if you can't do that work anymore, they'll provide benefits. Or They'll, they'll, they'll do something called an, you know, only, or sorry, any occupation, which means, you know, literally like if you can't be uh, really employed at all, uh, that's really the only way those disability benefits will continue. But again, those definitions, there's a lot of hybrids in between. So look at your employee benefits to truly understand your definition of disability and also what your elimin elimination period is. So let's go ahead and move up here to taxes. So you might see something on your taxes called OASDI tax. So that stands for old age survivors and 
disability insurance. Um, and this is commonly known as social security tax. So you can see here that you're wondering, well, why does she, why is she not paying any social security tax on this paycheck? But she's paid some throughout the year before. So you pay social security tax only on income up to only up to wages of 142,800, which was the wage base last year. For 2022, you'll only pay social security in uh, tax on on wages up to 147,000. So since she's already made, you can see year to date, she's already made higher than the wage base. She's no longer making uh, contributions to social security through her paycheck. So social security is 6.2% from the employee and 6.2% from the employer, combining at 14 point, what is that? 14.4% if I know my math. Um, and then Medicare, you see that she is still contributing to Medicare. So Medicare, unlike social security tax does not have a cap. So if she makes a million dollars, she pays, she'll be capped for social security, but, but not for Medicare. Medicare will continue. Um, and another thing is that she'll also pay an additional there's a 2.9%. Did I get that right? Yeah, 2.9%. So sorry, 2.9% is the regular Medicare tax, which you pay 1.45 as the employee and the employer pays the other 1.45. But there's also an additional 0.9% um, additional Medicare tax if your earnings exceed 200,000 as a single filer or 250,000 as a married filer. So we can tell that um, certainly Susan is going to go over that threshold. So she'll have to pay an additional 0.9% Medicare tax uh, on top of the, uh, on top of the 1.45 here. So federal income tax, um, you know, certainly this is the amount that they take out for federal income tax is based on, you can see here on the bottom of the pay stub. So she's got, so they, her marital status, she's married and she's elected, they might show up as an exemption or an allowance, right? So she's, she's done, um, she has, you know, three for allowances and 25 on the state level, which means that she, she actually doesn't want to withhold as much taxes uh, from her paycheck by, you know, claiming these exemptions or allowances. So this might be the case of she's married, but, you know, let's say that they have kids and they expect some type of like child tax credit or some other, um, some other, some other way that they're going to reduce their taxable income they can claim exemptions or allowances. Um, I'm going to sh go ahead. I'm going to share this link um, on the on the um, on the group after this call. But there's a calculator that the here we go. Taxes, taxes, taxes. So there's a there's a calculator that uh, IRS has that helps you understand really how many exemptions or allowances that you should claim. Uh, and and you send you give that uh, form W four to your employer your payroll. Uh, your payroll department uh, to really to really tell you how much you know how much of your income you want withheld for federal and state income taxes. So um, you know based on those exemptions um, um, allowances, you know they're they're taken out. She's paid twenty seven thousand dollars in federal tax uh, this year, which doesn't mean she owes that much. That's just how much she's withheld for the year. And you're going to see that on W two when you receive that. That's going to show up in box two is how much you withheld from from your income as an employee. So uh, moving on here, we have the state tax. So Susan actually, she works for me somehow, but she she lives in California. So she's actually earning her income in California. So she pays state income tax. And you may or may not see this uh, on your pay statement. She also pays state, bill state disability insurance um, as an employee tax. Uh, in California, at least last year, she paid 1.2% of earnings, uh, sorry, 1.2% on earnings up to, it had its own wage base, kind of like social security had a wage base, but it had a wage base of 128 to 98 uh, in 2021. So just quickly, um, so California state disability insurance is a state specific program that provides short-term disability insurance and, and paid federal, sorry, paid family leave, PFL, wage replacement benefits to eligible workers who need time off, uh, time off work. So five states, California, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island require employee contributions to these state disability insurance programs. So pretty interesting. I live in Texas where 
we don't we don't have very many taxes coming out of our paychecks, but we got taxes in other places, right? So I think as as Andy mentioned, I think last week on his call, you know, you, you pay your taxes just some, you know, just just in different ways than other states, just depending on where you live. So moving forward, I think we got so we have our earnings, our deductions, um, our employee taxes. Again, like these contributions that were made to the HSA, one of the great benefits of an HSA or an FSA is those contributions are also excluded from wages, you know, that are subject to employment taxes. So for example, if if Susan is contributing the $7200 7200 family max to her HSA, not only let's let's assume she's in the 32% tax bracket, she's saving she's saving $2300 in taxes plus an additional I know that she's you know, she, she's above this wage base. So let's just take the Medicare tax of you know, 0.0. So 1.45% Medicare. So she'll exclude that HSA contribution from that as well. So she'll save an additional hundred dollars in taxes from the federal level uh, because it's excluded from that, um, you know, the FICA, that uh, employment tax as well. So the last thing I want to show on this pay statement before we jump into any questions are net pay, right? So most of us just look at this number on our pay statement. How much am I actually bringing home? How much do we have, you know, to buy dinner tonight? So Susan gets, you know, after it's it's pretty amazing. So Susan got paid eighty nine hundred dollars this paycheck, but five thousand dollars ended up in her bank account. So you can see it's typically going to have your bank name, the the name if you made maybe named that account something specific. Like this is her her MTM compensation account, and then her account number, just the last four digits. Um, what one thing about? Um, let's see here. So one thing you can do is you can see that there might be multiple here. Like you could choose multiple financial institutions that you want a portion of your income to be sent to in terms of direct deposit. So ideas there. Let's say that you don't. We talked about the mortgage statement last week. Let's say that you didn't have escrow. So you weren't you weren't paying for home related insurance and property taxes directly through your mortgage uh, payment. You'd have to pay you'd have to save up those expenses on the side, which some families are paying, you know, upwards of ten thousand dollars for those things per year. So you could consider something like setting up a separate savings account specifically for your escrow, like kind of self escrowing in a way, uh, for those taxes and insurance. Um, you could set up a bank account and tell your employer, "Hey, I want. Let's say that your, um, let's say that your taxes and insurance for the year are going to be ten thousand dollars. So if I divide that by twenty six payroll periods, you could tell your, you could tell tell your employer, "Hey, I want to have three hundred eighty five dollars per paycheck sent to this different savings account." Right? You can use you can use your employer, you know, as a as a as a way to automate your savings strategies. Whether that's certainly we talked about the 401k, the HSA, but also in terms of uh, other savings objectives like emergency funds, if you're trying to build that up, future down payments on a home or your car, holiday funds. I know some people do like a Christmas or a, you might do a, like a Hanukkah fund or something like that at the end of the year. You want that built up without having to kind of it's there when you, you know, it's it's there when you, you like by the time you need to buy a car, the money's in that account because you've been automating it from your paycheck. Uh, and, and just other things like travel expenses. If you're going to go on that $5,000 trip every year, but you always say, oh, like, where do I get this money from? Maybe you can set up an automation through your payroll to save for those things. Um, so before I jump into any questions, I want to just tell you the, um, I'll go ahead and jump to jump to my noggin here. So there's a few notes I have here about really how to, you know, what are some things that you should do, like kind of going going beyond the basics, measure twice, and also how can you keep finance personal when going through your pay statement. So one is request a copy of your employee benefits handbook. So look at, get your handbook and get your pay statement and look at them side by side. There may some, there may be some opportunities when you enroll in, in benefits that you may not be taking advantage of that's you know on your pay, pay statement. Like for example, if you don't see disability insurance on your pay statement, right? But you see it in your employee benefits, maybe you didn't enroll or you need to make a note to your uh, your payroll department, hey, or your HR, like, hey, I think I'm pretty sure I signed up for long term disability. You know that voluntary coverage. Like, can we make sure that's right? So again, that's a way to measure twice. Uh, also, as we said, 
review your disability insurance uh, details, including that elimination period, which was that really that time equivalent deductible, and also the specific definition of disability. Also, while you're at it, if you have employer-sponsored retirement plans, ask for what's called the summary plan description, the SPD, to review the details of your employer-sponsored retirement plans. Um, th th we talk a lot in the group about, hey, you know, Roth 401k, traditional 401k, there's this whole backdoor, mega backdoor Roth and in-plan Roth conversions and in-plan dist in-service distributions. All those different fun little strategies we talk about in the group may or may not exist in your specific plan. So ask your employer for that summary plan description to understand the specific details of your plan because they vary. Um, also, verify the designated beneficiaries of your group life insurance policy and uh, policies and your employer-sponsored retirement accounts. So when you log in, when you're looking at your paycheck, go ahead and make sure that all of your other benefits, like your uh, your your death benefits, that all of those beneficiaries are designated, both your primary and your contingent. Especially, you know, married with kids, you definitely want them to have immediate access as soon as possible to that money if something were to happen to you. Um, also review your annual uh, form W-2, which I showed an example of. Um, so the various employer employee deductions are, are are going to be reported in box 12 and those various box 12s uh, with that those unique codes. So I'm going to share that link to that list of codes uh, as soon as the video ends here. Um, let's see. Oh, and lastly, I, I wanted to say, discuss your remaining vacation pay with your family. As I mentioned early on, like will will taking more time off actually improve your personal wellness? right? In other areas of your life. And even, you know, by taking some time off that could improve really your, how productive you are, or just, you know, how nice of an employee you are to work with, uh, during the day. So take advantage of your, um, your vacation. I, I worked at a job for nine years and only took three days off total. And I'm just like, why did I do that? Like that I built so many kind of toxic relationships and anxiety from not taking that time off. So, you know, go ahead and take advantage if you have that uh, opportunity at your employer. Um, especially if it doesn't roll over to future years as well. Um, and also with that, um, will your unused PTO carry over to, over to future years? So find that out before the year ends so it's not too late. Um, last note here. So review your pay statement as a checkpoint throughout the year, right? Make adjustments to your elective deductions and tax withholding as needed, especially if you're doing other things like Roth conversions. You can withhold the taxes from your employer if you'd like, rather than making any... Um, estimated tax payments with um, really from your bank account, right? So you can just, you can, you can take a lot more control of your pay um, than you might, you, you might first think. So go ahead and look at this as a checkpoint, maybe four times a year to make sure you're on track uh, with all your numbers and opportunities. So multiply your pay period amounts by the number of remaining pay periods, then add your year to date, year to date amounts on each of these parts of the statement uh, to determine your estimated year in numbers, right? So do not wait till the end of December, right? To find out that you have over contributed to an HSA or over contributed to a 401k or under contributed to those things. One thing about, um, I'll just, I'll add here is when you're contributing to an HSA through your employer, your health savings account directly through your employer, that contribution is also excluded from the, the employment taxes. But if, let's say the year ends, thankfully you still have until April 15th to max out your HSA. But guess what? The rest that you're putting into the HSA after the year ended out of your bank account will not receive that additional, you know, the 7.65% social security and Medicare combined taxes. So again, uh, you know, don't leave money, don't leave taxes and money off the table um, or on the table uh, by you know, just not having as much awareness of your pay statement over time. Um, I think that's it for a ton of stuff on this uh, pay statement for sure. I'm going to go ahead and jump to comments and then we'll maybe even get out a minute early tonight. Let's see. Um, not too many questions there. So Teresa asked, the paid disability, is that short-term disability? Many employers pay that, but not long-term disability. That's correct. So the the paid the paid um, disability insurance the employer paid um, that was 
on this specific one, it was long-term disability. Um, the employer paid both ha both short-term and long-term. But yes, on average, employers will usually only cover the short-term and leave the long-term up to the employee. So that's one of those things that, again, if you have an adequate emergency fund to cover really the, the, the maximum length of short-term disability, it might make sense to self-fund short-term ability, short-term disability, but elect long-term disability coverage through your employer. Typically, group coverage is going to be less expensive than getting private insurance elsewhere. Um, one thing about, I, I just thought about with health insurance, again, it's it's great to know tr like really the true compensation of your work before you make decisions about maybe you know another job offering or you're just going to terminate employment is a lot of employees don't realize how much their employers pay right toward toward all those you know employer paid deductions uh on average i would say the on average um employers pay between 20 to $35,000 in employee benefits and that's even outside of the employer match on 401k's so you know make sure that when you're comparing compensation models between two companies that you're understanding really the benefits they're paying for as an employer as well. Um, let's see here. David Meyer says, short-term disability is going to vary by employer and by state. California requires yeah, short-term disability, which is where they lived. If the employer doesn't pay for it or provide it, the employee pays a payroll tax. And then since Susan is such, such a highly compensated, oh wait, I wanna do this. Why did I not do this the whole time? Since Susan is high, such a highly compensated employee, will measure twice money be carrying key key person insurance on her? Absolutely. So Susan actually does all the work and I just lay on a hammock all day. So if something happens to her, I want key man insurance so that I can stay on my hammock. That's for sure. Andy says, New Jersey has a new has a, has a few different disability and other social security withheld from Chechex. Oh gosh, states. States just drive me nuts. They all have different rules. One thing I did want to note is um, you may not see Social Security being taken out of your paycheck, right? That's something I should I should definitely uh, make note of. Is that if um, really so? Some federal employees, state, local government employees who are covered under a public retirement plan may be exempt from paying into Social Security. Um, if that's the point, you may also be subject to what's called. So if you work for Let's say you work for a government employee and don't pay into social security for half of your job or half of your career. And then you work in a career the second half that does pay into social security. You can't double dip, right? So you might have a reduction of benefits of your own benefits with what's called the windfall elimination provision, WEP. Again, it's kind of beyond the scope of this call. And then the government uh, for spousal benefits, if you receive both you know, government benefits and you are worked in the, in the private sector, you may be subject to government pension offset called GPO. So again, beyond beyond the scope of this, but I think maybe Andy has some videos on that. Uh, jumping in, Teresa, though my pay and benefits withholding are very consistent, 2020 Fed, Social Security, FICA, and state deductions varied almost all of my paychecks. Oh, that's so annoying. Previous years were made way more consistent. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, if you were getting fit, if you were getting the same fixed amount every month, um, in terms of your, if you were only getting paid like paid a basic salary, uh, those things should be pretty consistent, especially, um, I pretty consistent, especially if you're under the wage base, for example, for social security or not subject to the, uh, the additional Medicare tax. So it could be due to variable income or just your, your payroll department trying to figure things out along the way. Um, Sorry, I'm not sure exactly what happened there. Uh, David Foltz, cool piggy bank abacus and rulers. Thank you. So this abacus is what I use. Um, the abacus is what I use to calculate how much to convert to Roth each year. And the piggy bank is where I fund uh, for education. That's my 529 account before we have kids. And then I'll dump it all out when we actually do have kids one day. Andy says, great point. Benefits are often a sizable part of your total compensation indirectly. So don't overlook the benefit package when deciding between different employers. That's yeah, absolutely. I've had it where they say this employer offered me a $20,000 raise, like I'm taking it. And I go, wait a minute, but you just, you left $30,000 worth of benefits off the, uh, on the table because they're not going to cover those other benefits. 
Thank you so much, Teresa. You're so kind with your heart. Uh, you did such a comprehensive job in explaining the pay stub. Didn't leave many questions. Oh, that uh, so that's why they didn't have many questions. I hope that yeah, they either they either uh, fell asleep or we covered everything. Uh, and uh, David Myers, employer empl employers still cover on average over eighty percent of the cost of health insurance. It's huge, absolutely. Uh, again, going back, your your employer is probably paying twenty thousand dollars plus for your benefits. And Andy says that abacus is what Cody tells. Abacus is what Cody is all his financial planning with. That's right. Um, yeah, the only thing I'm I'm trying to figure out how to make it do is Monte Carlo analysis, but that's uh, that's the only thing I can't do with the abacus so far. Um, any other questions? Since you're still awake, thank you so much, Facebook user. Any other questions? I'll let you type for ten seconds while I calculate amortization. Money Abacus Pro, yes. It's the most inexpensive. It's even more inexpensive than new retirement for you doing cash flow projection. Right, ab <laughs> right Abacus, that's right. Thanks so much, all y'all. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign off for the night. I hope this has been valuable. And if you don't look at your pay statement after this, I'm gonna be so upset with you. So uh, next time I see you, uh, hopefully you'll know everything about where your money's going before it hits your bank account. All right, well, take care, guys. I'll see you in a month from now. I think next month we're going to we're going to cover how to understand your 401k statement. Oh, and your summary plan description, the things that I mentioned this time. And I'll probably I'll probably sneak sneak a few things in, but I I appreciate you all and I'll see you I'll see you next month. Take care guys. Thanks so much.